Hello guys, this is Kidlike, and this is the series in which I try to write an application to replace and improve upon the functionality of the YouTube sub box. As you will undoubtedly notice, there has been quite a break in the videos. Yeah, look, all that matters is that we're here, finally. And today, we must answer the question, to test or not to test. I'm sure I mentioned this, but I want to write tests for my application. And before you start writing tests, you really need to know, you know, what to test and what not to test. Uh, otherwise, how, how will you even begin? As I mentioned, I want to try and use as much TDD as possible. Test-driven development, for those that don't like acronyms, like myself. But I'm no expert, and... I don't promise to do it 100% of the time. Still, since the main idea behind DDD is to write tests first, it's probably really important to understand what's... what kind of tests you're supposed to write and stuff like that. Now, I think the answer to that is really simple. If you want something to work, you test it. If you don't care that it doesn't work, then you don't have to. A more interesting question is how much to test or how to test something, but if you're sure that this is a functionality you want working, you will test it somehow. And then obviously you want as much of the testing automated, so you don't have to do it by hand. Now the issue that you could come up with here is that we are currently going to be writing something akin to this, our spike, in which we are essentially trying to create some kind of an API where we can see search results. For now, this will involve code that is similar to what you can see here. I suppose you could imagine something like the following interface. Let's call it YouTube search and have it return list of results. For now, we'll just import any old result. This will be some kind of a class. Do search, whatever, it doesn't matter. String inputs or search query. And then uh, int max results, we can do that. And under this search, we'll probably have somewhere this YouTube class, and we will be performing something like this inside the method. So how do you test this? Normally, if you would have an implementation of this class, and we can imagine how a generic implementation would go. Well, once again, let's let's do it. Let's not let's not care about naming or anything like that right now. All of that will be fixed later. So let's say we would have YouTube in this class, and we would inject that YouTube into the implementation. Then the method would return and perform something like this. We would have the search query be here. We would have the max results be here. Turns out it has to be a long. Let's actually refactor that. Yes, yes, so this should be a long to make sure that it works. And it throws an IO exception. We probably will just catch it and do something with it. Let's not worry about that too much. And we want to return, actually we just want to return this response and let's let's do it like that and there you go uh, the public api key yeah, again we can just copy this one uh put it at the bottom the main aspects of what i want to talk about here is that we have injected youtube into this class and we're doing something with it this makes perfect sense it's really simple. You have a YouTube class, so you might as well inject something like that because you can build it up like somewhere else completely. It doesn't need anything. And then you do some kind of work with it. Problem is, okay, how do you test this? Hmm, right? And the answer to that is usually that there are multiple ways to do it. As I've written here, I have had some experience testing a uh, database, more specifically Hibernate code, which uses something similar. You would, in Hibernate, you would have something, uh, we probably don't have Hibernate imported here, so it would be like a session factory that you inject into the class, and then you do something with session factory in the current session. This is the, uh, I believe, the GPA or Java Persistent Annotations 
way of doing things that they are currently moving to, if my understanding is correct, because everything else has been deprecated, so they, they, they want people to use that API. Yeah, and I have written code like that at work, and I've tested it, and my solution to that was to mock out the API completely. So I would just use Mokito to create really complicated mocking mechanism for the session factory. It's really hard to, to show without the actual session factory. So let's just import it for a bit. All right, 10 hours later, we can now import the class. So what do you usually do with this class? You do session factory, get current session, and then do stuff like build, no, no, query, I think. Yeah, you create a query for a some kind of class let's just use youtube search class it doesn't matter because we don't have any uh maybe not create query but create yeah it is actually create query but not by class it's it's far more complicated you actually need the session i believe object do you get criteria builder there we go there we now you create a query for YouTube search class and then it's like it's this API is fucking horseshit as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> because it needs so many random objects just popping out of anywhere. Oh criteria builder, let's take that out of the session for some reason. All right, where is it? It's entity manager method. Why? Why? A much more reasonable approach would be to have like just a general way to build those criteria, I guess. But that's what they used to have. They used to have detached criteria, but they moved away from them for some reason. Now this is the preferred method. I don't understand it. Obviously, I'm not looking into this stuff because I really don't care for Hibernate or GPA one way or the other. But. Uh, that's what we use at work. So what I did is I, I created a kind of a class. I call it a mock session factory, which is a really poor name for it because it's not actually a session factory at all, but it can hook into any session factory and any mock session factory anyway, one that's created with Mokito and just mock out all the interactions between all the methods. Well, at least the ones I use. I didn't do it for the entirety of the API, just for things that I needed. So you can add where clauses, you can add order clauses, you can add um, what you select specifically from the query. Uh, you can do stored procedures. I've been working on that. But that's not the only way you could do it. There's a few more ways that you could have uh, tested a database API. One way to do that is to have an in-memory database that is launched for the tests, populated with some data, and then taken down after the tests are done. To go even further beyond, you could completely have a separate test database running somewhere or even launch it before all the tests and use that like a whole database server, even if it's on the same machine. So I think very few people would suggest that. So which one to choose and why did I choose Mokito in this scenario? All right, so let's weigh the pros and cons of these situations. So if you have a database running all the time, just as a separate thing that's not attached to the tests whatsoever, the problem is you still have to run one of these at the start of a test and close it at the end of a test. You need to have the infrastructure for that set up. It's probably a pain in the ass. And your tests need to make sure that they clean up after themselves, meaning that they don't affect the state. It's also probably pretty slow, though not as slow as the other option, which is to have an in-memory database that you create at the start of some test class and then tear it down automatically. Now, the pro of that option is you don't have to worry at all about 
cleaning up because you will always create and destroy the database before and after the test so it won't bother you much you 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 only need to make sure in a, a much smaller scale maybe as low as a single test not even a test class but obviously recreating your database is just a lot of work even if it's in memory so that will be really slow so the third option is of course the fastest you just mock everything and usually the argument against mocking is that you when you're mocking you're not really testing anything that's under the mock so you're not really testing that your queries would reach the database for example you could have a bad entity configuration and you won't know until you run it. Because your mocks probably aren't going to go as far as to look into the entity annotations. Which makes sense. If your mocks need to be so complicated as to do that, at that point, you may as well just use the real thing. Or something close to the real thing. Still, I chose mocks in this case. Because Hibernate still does have this session factory, which is relatively mockable as far as it can be considered to be mockable there's patterns to its api even even if those patterns are crazy there's still patterns so it's fine ish and the main logic i thought about is the main argument against m just mocking something like that out doesn't really hold up necessarily when you're talking about things like databases so what I mean about that is that even if you set up a database, in some sense that is still a mock database, it's very unlikely that your tests will recreate the exact everything as it is in your real database. They will have all the triggers and everything ready. The reason that is because more than likely that your test database doesn't depend on changes on your real database. Whatever changes you apply to the database, you create new views or whatever, blah, blah, blah. It still translates into a kind of a mock. You're just mocking something much further into the database code. There's also no guarantee that, for example, the memory implementation of the database that you use is 100% compatible with the database you use in production. There could be differences which, for which tests will pass, but production will just fail or be inadequate in some other way. These are possibilities. I don't have any practical experience with regards to that, but it's possible. The only way to circumvent that is to simply put, as I said, use the very first or last option, which is to have a database constructed at the very beginning of your tests and then write all you, then make sure that all the changes in the database are the same as in your production and, and then write all your tests in a way that they clean up after themselves. But even that can be highly unpredictable basically database is a huge beast so it's really hard to say that uh, you're actually cleaning up after yourself you could probably do something with a transaction mechanism to maybe work around that but sounds like it would be a huge pain in the ass but it is an option i suppose that you could try even though probably not recommended but if you don't go for that option then you're really just asking the question, what do I mock? Whenever you're not using the exact same things you would use in the production, even though they may not necessarily be the same in the sense of uh, literally connecting to a production database, but I mean in the category of the same things. Whenever you don't use the same database, the same kind of database with the same kind of tables and stuff that you would have in production, you're still putting a mock somewhere. Either you're creating mock tables, or entire mock database, or you're mocking the database API. It's not a question of whether you mock or not, it's the question of what are you mocking, and at what point. And when your question is like that, then really you just have to look at all the possibilities again, and compare the pros and cons again. And the important things here to look at, I think, are how simple 
it is to implement and understand the implementation of the tests. And what are the risks of not going through certain code for your application? The reason I marked out the session factory instead of opting for the other solutions was specifically because the way I saw it, this would be the simplest implementation, the easiest to understand implementation, and one with very few risks. The only thing that's not tested by that kind of a implementation is whether my entities are mapped to the correct fields. As far as I'm concerned, the risk of there being an issue with that is very small. And if an issue like that ever arises, I could probably write unit tests for that specific aspect as well, which would still be easier and simpler than uh, setting up a whole in-memory database and then making sure that I fill it with the appropriate tables and everything like that. Aside from that specific aspect, all that you would be really testing additionally instead of using the MOG is that the Hibernate works, which is a bit of a waste now, isn't it? <laughs> because it's Hibernate. So having all of that in mind, let's do a little bit of cleanup here so we don't have the unnecessary things. Uh getting in the way. What should we do for YouTube API? Should we mock the YouTube API just like I mocked Hibernate? It is probably possible to do that. Probably. But it will also probably be a huge pain in the butt. Here's one huge immediate limitation. Final classes. Mocking final classes is possible, but it requires a lot of additional resources that are difficult to set up and they will make the tests a lot more complex. Another thing about YouTube API is that it has a lot of uh, non-recurring, I would assume, methods. For example, well, in this case, yeah, what, what is this? Uh, where is this method that we just looked at? What class is this? Let's try to find a class. Yeah, it's just some kind of a list which extends a YouTube request. There's there's some patterns to the API, I suppose. It's not that crazy. So you could probably uh, mock out, let's say, the list. Probably within possibility to mock out the list. It's not final. And uh, technically speaking, you could probably just return a real search list response. Because it probably has all the setters that you need, yeah. So maybe that is actually within possibility. It would just be a bit of a mix between Mokito and non-Mokito. Or well, you, you don't have to use Mokito, of course. You could just use your own classes. YouTube itself is also not a final class, so that's also easily extendable. Yeah, the more I look at this, the more I think, yeah, it's probably actually not that difficult to do it. But now we have this search class and there's all the all of these kind of probably classes that that you know sponsors of course we're not going to use all of them which simplifies the mocking of everything yeah maybe maybe i will go down a similar path as i went with hibernate where i will have a youtube api completely mocked out should we mock youtube should we not mock youtube hmm hmm because at the end of the day, if you're not going to use the actual YouTube API in your tests, and we don't actually have the resources to create a similar API, then you're going to have to mock something. Either you will create a server, which reads uh, local host with the same API paths and inputs, and then tries to translate it to something, or you will mock perhaps the... Uh, but you can see the the HTTP layer by mocking this, which I assume is used for all HTTP requests in YouTube API. Or you could just write a mock class for YouTube. And once again, perhaps even more so in this case, because we are not dependent on random annotations, that would 
probably achieve the same exact result in terms of testing something, but would be faster to write, easier to understand for everyone involved, and pretty much just as good in terms of determining whether your code works properly or not. So yeah, let's give it a try to mock out YouTube completely and see what happens. In some sense, I would like to also make sure that YouTube as an object then doesn't appear anywhere and we just completely separate it away. We will probably need our own package for that. So let's create a YouTube package in which we will create a class called First of all, let's rename this class. Well, no. I think even a better solution is to just have for start as a search package. The idea is that we want this YouTube object to be completely hidden behind some kind of an interface. Perhaps something like this. The benefit of that is that if we do use a mock, then in any integration test that we would do, we could then just mock out these interfaces because all they would do is just correctly call the YouTube API. And once again, because the question will be not if we mock or not, but rather where do we place the mock, this isn't inappropriate in that sense. Once again, it will achieve pretty much the same result in terms of testing that all of our application works appropriately. Uh, so, 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 for this particular case, we might as well create a interface called search. Interface called search will do some kind of search. What a surprise. And the kind of search that I wanted to do is I want it to give me some kind of result. A list of results, perhaps. Well, we don't know the type at the moment, but we wanted to... Once again, given a search query and a limit of results to return something. Now, we might as well create that object from the start because uh, we kind of more or less know what we want. We, we don't know exactly, but we'll open the Google API and we'll look into it. Uh, or rather than, rather than Google API, we'll open our uh, storyboard. Let's just call it simply search result. And this will be a class which will be more or less a container for uh, data. So let's go ahead and go to our backlog, which we... The sprint is still going, boys. It's current. We probably need to edit it to, for it to work properly, but yeah. So we're doing this, and what do we want? I can see title and link. So that's all we need right now. So we want private final. In fact, let's just do it once again with a kind of an interface, perhaps, as weird as that may seem. And uh, the interface will just be string uh, get title. And uh, for now, let's do HTTP URL, get URL. Oh, this reminds me, we didn't import a URL library. Let me find one. All right, so this is okay. HTTP license is under Apache. I believe this is the HTTP library used by Android, usually. Well, not directly by Android, but uh, it provides a nice uh, abstraction for an URL over here. It's a final class, and it has nice abstraction. That's all there is to it. That's why I like it. So we will have a title and an URL, and uh, the search will provide us with a list of search results. The title is clear, but uh, the URL, it's not clear what kind of URL that would be now, is it? It specifically won't be ever clear because the search results don't actually specify, right? We, we just know that there's a title in the URL, but we don't know what we're searching or what we're looking for. That's quite interesting, actually. We can um, not really manipulate that from this interface. One way to do it is obviously to add more parameters. 
Another way to do it is just to have a different implementation and then select the correct implementation, perhaps using some kind of factory. We'll see. For now, since we only need one type of search, it doesn't make any sense to do it any other way. And it doesn't make sense to specify here either. Right, and this will be the YouTube package. Let's just have it completely separate, maybe, actually, so that we know everything in this package can be mocked out without problems and we can have here the actual YouTube let's call it channel search which implements the search will return a list of search results these classes now are obsolete so I'll get the hell I get them out of here and uh, we can get started on some testing isn't it right what the hell happened for some reason, this test class is not even public. Something broke, let me see. Alright, I changed my uh, test5 class implementation to this. And uh, let's try that again, shall we? Create new test. There we go, much better. And now we can run all tests and bam. Both, both of them fail. This is a disaster. Okay, we can delete the main test. We don't need that anymore because we have a different test. And there we go. <laughs> All according to plan-ish. What do we test first? First and foremost, uh, we want our classes to be pretty safe to use. I don't want no shenanigans here, like someone inputting minus one in the max results and expecting minus one results. No, no, no. So, for these cases, I want the search query to be... Do I want it to be non-blank? Actually, we can check that. So, let's say we do a completely blank query. It doesn't work. What about if it's a space? It also doesn't work. What about if it's a tabulation character? It also doesn't work. So, it's pretty fair to assume that... Blank queries should not be allowed by the application. So let's start of this. No blank queries. And uh, the test for that is going to be we're going to need a search, search, which will be a new YouTube channel search. And if we do, and we're going to do an assertion. Assert that exception of type, let's say, illegal argument. I like illegal argument and illegal state most. In this case, since it's an argument, that's the problem. I'll use legal argument. And it's thrown by search, do search of, let's say, null. And uh, let's say one, it doesn't matter what this second input is, as long as it is valid so that it doesn't impact the functionality. This test will surely fail because we have done no such thing as you can see here. So we will do a quick test. Is string utils is an util class which can quickly check if something is blank and then we can throw new illegal argument exception. I don't really care about messages too much, but for now let's just use cannot be blank and the name of the variable. It'll be fine. And now the test will pass. We can do the similar thing with max results. Uh, but before we do that, in fact, what, what we should have really done is done uh, this. Uh, if we were pure TDDists, we should have done this. We should have checked for null, because that also passes the tests. And then we would be like, oh no, what What if we do a blank, you know, just empty thing. And then, bam, expected code to raise a trouble. And then we would have actually done it this way. So sometimes I will probably forget to go through all these steps. Well, not forget, but I'll refuse to go through all these steps. In theory, right, we should probably check something about the message because otherwise we will not be 100% sure that uh, 
this is specifically for the the specific argument because we could have written a test like this for example and well <laughs> yeah we could have forgotten to add this query and instead just had the query for max results and if our test was like this it would you know it wouldn't be a perfect test but ne but now still everything works so it's a slightly better test similar thing we can do for max results right so but that we can write in a separate test entirely only positive max results now this naming of these tests can be for some people a little bit blasphemous but let i'll be honest with you i never look at the names of the tests so what you name them really doesn't matter. If this was test one and test two, I'd probably wouldn't even notice. So because because it doesn't really matter in in the grand scheme of things. The code should pretty much explain what's what's what. So in this case, we want something similar to this, but we still also want some search. But we want to write a proper query that works. But give it a negative. In this case, we expect max results to be the thing that we will find wrong with this message. Again, this is a case where you could, do, in in pure test-driven development, you you wouldn't do it like this. You would write all of this from scratch, and you would do it step by step. But I feel like that's a bit of a waste of time because I mean. The API is clear, and uh, again, you could, you would then have step by step writing this properly, and then we're gonna do this and uh, X results. Right. So I I don't think hopping in these slightly greater steps than you may expect is a big problem. Because at the end of the day, you should still make sure that you write the tests. For example, for this case, for zero. And uh, uh, as long as you hop in these kind of one big assertion steps, you shouldn't, you shouldn't go beyond what's reasonable with DDD. And I think your code won't suffer for it, which is the important aspect now isn't it this code sure looks shit doesn't it <laughs> let's let's try to do a little bit of a refactoring here so obviously we're creating a search twice so why not do it just once before every test even if it's gonna be a bit of a useless perhaps in some cases i doubt it but uh for now, nothing has changed due to this refactoring. A lot of this also seems very samey. Because uh, it's really just... What's what's the difference between this code? It's the inputs and the message that we're looking for. So we can actually refactor that. We can do Control alt v and then get the search query. Move it out of the... Uh, what you call this... The lambda expression. Uh, just the one occurrence, please. Max results, and uh, let's call this error type. And I want the error type to be a first parameter. Yeah, let's clean this up, and yeah, 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 yeah. And now we can do Control Alt M to do this and say assert certain valid search why not this eh let's do it for all and uh then we can inline all of these for a really nice uh situation and now there's really no point to keep these two tests separate cuz they're kind of doing the same thing so let's just say call these invalid searches so search query null is invalid, search query blank is invalid, max results minus one is invalid, and max results zero is invalid. I think that's really nice and clean and easy to understand. But maybe that's just me. Tell me if you disagree. <laughs> All right, but uh, we haven't even started with the real shit now, have we? All right, so what would 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 we want to do next? 
return value is never used. What we want to do next is obviously perform the search, but to do the search we need some YouTube marking, because now when we give some kind of, let's say, search result, and uh, we want to see the result. This is where we're going to implement the thing from here. We will have some kind of YouTube injected. As of now, we don't know how it will work yet. And we will do a lot of mocking, mocking, mocking. And we'll see what happens. One big issue that I see with this immediately is that we will constantly have to inject the public API key, which is just going to be annoying. But for now, let's do it. But uh, definitely, I will want to make sure that public API key is injected just once somewhere. Not like this, man. Not like this. So what kind of a test do we want to write first? This test is going to fail spectacularly and for a long time. So let's say perform YouTube search. For now, we're not saying anything much more about what we're going to do. We're just going to do a search. We're going to do a search. We're going to call our query. Uh, let's code. Why not? And we're going to expect one result. And um, we will get search results. What do we want to know about the search results? Assert that search results is not null. That's probably really important. We don't even need anything mockable for this because we will never expect the result list to be null. That would be just annoying and stupid. So at least let's return a new array list. You, you could even call this then instead, uh, for example, you could do it like this and say, okay, this was the test for no null list, whatever, you know. And uh, then you would do the second perform YouTube search, which, in which you don't do the assertion because you already done it here. But I mean, our API already supports it better, so I think there is no need once again for this kind of small stepping as long as you do it. Uh, at least as you're writing the test, you'll be fine. So we probably expect to contain exactly some kind of a search result. What would that search result be? We don't have an object for that. So let's create an object for that YouTube channel. Again, purists would say, oh, you need to write something like this, YouTube channel. Or rather, you would say channel, not even channel, search result. Result would be equal to new YouTube channel. And then, you know, now that YouTube channel doesn't exist, you can create YouTube channel. This is, this is just playing around. Don't take people who actually suggest to do this seriously. They're just being silly. Uh, you know, just make sure that you never really step out of line, but that doesn't mean you have to go 100% straight, you know what I'm saying? YouTube channel is going to be a simple container, as far as I'm concerned. It will be a container of uh, two things. It will contain the channel name and a channel ID. You can initialize these. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. I keep forgetting because at work I use one type of Java style and here I want to use my original. Well, original is the one that I like to use, Java style. Right, so we want our YouTube channel to have a name and ID because we know, I mean, I could go here and look at what the YouTube data API would offer me, but uh, obviously we need those two things. Uh, reference. And we are doing a search, we're doing a list, and uh, we can even try this out here first and then write the test. Where is it? Oh, it's because the scripts. God damn it. Probably need this thing to work. Okay. There we go. There we go, there we go. So, again, we'll do something like let's code, and we do like one, and we execute with auth, and then we get a bunch of responses, and that one what we want to do. 
Uh, oh, we also wanted to write type channel. So that, that worked anyway, but yeah, it kind is YouTube channel. And then we want uh, the channel ID and the title of the channel. Maybe at some point we'll also want the description, but right now that's all we need. Funnily enough, there's only one such channel. No such other channels exist. Makes sense. Names are pretty unique. But if, you know, if you remove, like, one of the words, you could suddenly get a lot more. Oh, it's, oh, never mind. I'm, I'm dumb. It's because I have one max result already. <laughs> Ignore what I just said, right? Yeah, there's actually half a million Let's Go channels. What, what great competition we're facing here. Still, this won't be quite trivial either as an object. You may think, oh, well, this is such a simple object. You don't need to write anything for it, like any tests. Yes, you do. <laughs> Especially if it's simple, then it's really quick to write the test. And uh, why wouldn't you write the test? So what's going on now here? All right, so, so let's comment that out. And then... As luck would have it, that this test passes because this test is, you know, fucked up. But at the end of the day, we do want to ignore it, I think, because if we ignore it, then uh, I think we'll see that it's ignored here. No. I think ignore is the wrong uh, thing to use. Disabled. <laughs> Makes sense. Just weird. Okay, so there we go. Now we see that there was an ignored uh, test. I would recommend to do this because then you don't have to worry about forgetting to come back to this test. You know that it's disabled for a reason because it's not finished. But you can, you know, not pay attention to it. You, you know what the sign means. Make sure you never have too many of such. Once again, we want to make sure that there's certain things imposed upon... Uh, the YouTube channel name and ID. In both cases, the name and ID shouldn't really be blank. So once again, uh, no blank name. We're going to do the similar situation where we have YouTube. Sorry. Well, yeah, in this case, we can do YouTube channel. YouTube channel is new YouTube channel. And we can say null and any ID. And we want to assert that exception of type, illegal argument exception, is thrown by, in fact, is thrown by this. This constructor will throw it. And uh, it specifically contains in the message channel name. And this test will fail horribly. It it uh, it doesn't even compile. Fail horribly. Oh, excellent. And with that, we have reached our 30 minute limit, which I started only after my rant, which is why you may be confused why it took so long. So next time, which will be soon, hopefully, uh, we will uh, proceed onwards with this and uh, try to implement our YouTube channel. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you later.